Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Really interesting talk. And I'm going to have a bit of chair's privilege and ask you two questions before we go to more general questions. And also, if any of the presenters wanted to say anything following um, their, their presentations that they weren't able to say because I rushed them through so much. And, and the, the first one is around, um, I, I'm sh sure you've heard of Professor Kevin Fenton. Um, if you haven't, it doesn't really matter. He, he, he did a study for Public Health England around uh, the height of the pandemic, around why so many um, people from the, the groups that you've mentioned were dying from COVID. And one of the conclusions that he came to, well, he had the recommendations he made was that you needed to have more people from those communities who are affected, and this could apply to from not just COVID, but you talked about COPD, from those communities who are affected, involved in a sort of like um, working in the NHS, working in public health to enable the, the people who they need to reach. So that first they can actually identify those individuals and then speak to them. So, so what do you, what, what's your view on that kind of thing, having more um, people from those communities who are affected actually doing the research, not just being participants? I 100% agree, Winston, 100%. Um, and I think it's that recognition of uh, familiarity from your patient uh, with, the, with the person that you see as your researcher who's caring for you or sort of um, leading or facilitating the research. And I do think um, Professor Mahendra Patel, who certainly has been leading the community outreach work from Oxford in terms of the, the big um, uh, COVID-19 trials, certainly has done that. He, he's one of the people. He's got a very close relationship with his colleagues in, in you know, your, your local pharmacy in, in Bradford or wherever else in, in the UK. And I think that, that is, is the key. It's, it's certainly having that uh, recognition and um, uh, familiarity and, and sort of trust building, actually, in terms of, you know, the pharmacists, trust uh trust you know Mahindra Patel and he said to me actually I had a chat with him but he wasn't sure whether he would it, say if it was somebody else employed to do what he did whether they would have had the same outcome and I think I think not Winston to be honest with you he was unique he is uniquely placed in terms of his trust with with pharmacists and with different communities that he was able to build um to 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 actually facilitate in terms of those communities taking part in research it, it's it's really important Question but before that, as I said, I want to ask you another question, and this yeah. is about the clinical trials processes, which uh, is relevant um, for the whole general discussion. And my understanding in, is that, and perhaps the others can come in as well, in North America, there's a legal requirement for the clinical trials population to be made up um, by um, different ethnic groups or racial groups within that you have to have those do you think that would be a good thing to have in the UK given that one of that could be ironically one of the advantages of Brexit whereas perhaps you couldn't have done it when we were <laughs> on the European medicines I don't know but I'm just thinking for the UK if we could have something like that because we have such a diverse population in the UK and so should our clinical trials reflect that legally not just a, a, a choice made by the, the, the clinical trials teams I do think that's a good idea, Vincent, um, and I think it would be something that would need um, certainly discussion. On it, what I would like to say is that I think research needs to be part of routine healthcare, and I think up and down the country, um, from north to south, all across different ethnic groups, actually, um, everybody needs to have the access to participate in research and understand why and um, although certainly having a quota that may be appropriate for, for a certain condition or disease I think we just need to make it more part of universal healthcare within the NHS and I think that that's something from the community level and upwards in terms of government input and regulation that um, that should be the, the overall board aim. I don't know what you think um, uh, Maria Augusta or um, Katrina so I, I think it's very interesting. Um, some of you will know Professor Chloe Yorkin at Queen Mary, um, who was previously head of the British HIV Association. And in quite a lot of her trials, she's actually stipulating that we have to have a certain proportion of women in different populations. So she's it's not law, but she's kind of not just talking about it, but actually putting it into practice. And of course, as you know, as a researcher, if we do that, sometimes we can find that our recruitment slows because it might be easier to get the 70 kilo white males. But 
actually that's how we extrapolate our findings. Should it be law? And with the US, I don't know how much the law, I know there, there are all these statutes, but I don't think there are any particular sanctions for not sticking to them. And I think that's one of the problems. They've got preg lack and stuff like that to include pregnant and lactating women. But people still don't do it. Yeah. But it, it, it's an initiative that sort of puts the idea in the researcher's head, whereas if it wasn't there, they wouldn't even think about think it. About it. Uh, Maria, what, do you have any, any comments on this? No, I, I think that I, I like the idea of sanctions. I think that people, they, they really respond well to sanctions. And I think that, you know, it's something that can, seems ra harsh, but I was, I, I don't know, I'm probably much older than everybody in the room. I, I was <laughs> raised in a lab that uh, my supervisor, a woman, you said, let's not use female rats, not female rice, because their hormones make, you know, the, the results all over the place. That's how many of the pharmacologists that are, you know, that are leading research were, were raised. So I think that, you know, it goes from the basic research into clinical research. I think that the, there, is a, there is a cultural shift that needs to happen and I don't think it's going to, to happen naturally in the rate and the pace that we need it to do. So I, I'm personally, I think that it's, and, and we, we, we adapt to, to these changes. That's what the research community has done um, for, you know, for the last 100 years. Go to the audience questions. As I said, because we sort of rushed you, you through your, your talks, I don't know if there's anything that you felt that you wanted to say that would have made the point even better that you didn't say um, before I go to, to questions. Either you or Catriona, do, do you have anything else that you want to say or ask each other uh, about the work that you're doing? I think one thing that we have found is people make assumptions about recruitment and how difficult it will be and one of our trials we specifically wanted to enroll women who were diagnosed with HIV in the third trimester of pregnancy and there was some concern that these days women should have their test at antenatal clinic they should be on lifelong therapy people said how many of these late presenting women are you going to get and so we thought between Kampala and Cape Town, it would take us a couple of years to enroll. And we fully enrolled in under six months. And that was 268 participants. And I think it just shows that actually sometimes we lie to ourselves and say, oh, it's too difficult to get these populations or these women won't want to be in a trial. But we recruited about four times faster than anticipated. And I've heard other similar examples. So I think that's just a point to make as well. Right. A lot of the, the, the questions are from anonymous attendees, so I can't really name them. But anyway, this one's actually for you. So you're on the screen now, so that's good. And it, it basically says an excellent talk. How do we extrapolate this to other vulnerable populations? Perhaps they're thinking of psychiatric patients, etc. I think your... for me, um, I think it's interesting. You said yourself in your introduction, when you think of most clinical trials, there are exclusion criteria. And you think of who's in that criteria. It's pregnancy and breastfeeding, um, under 18, um, either very low or very high body mass index, on intercurrent medication, renal failure, any sniff of any mental problem. And often the, the way we look at it, there's a difference between having major uncontrolled psychosis and not being able to make uh, a very um, informed decision. And that person is genuinely vulnerable. But there's millions of people that are on antidepressants for their more mild depressive disorders. And should we be excluding these people from trials? Isn't it actually important that we include them? Isn't it important that we understand any drug-drug interactions? And isn't it important that we actually do some qualitative work to look at their perceptions of being in a trial and being involved in their care? So I think we really need to talk about these things. I know I haven't answered the question, I've just reinforced it there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
right? And a sort of related question. It says, great to see the crossover between the talks. So complex, multi-morbid patients, crucial to study. How do we honestly extrapolate research outcomes to patients with multi-morbidity when not studied in, in, in these groups? Um, and again, it could be for you, but it could be for anyone, in, um, any of the panelists. So um, it's a very good question about the multi-morbidity. Um, I, I, I will be honest with you, my, my trial, the OPAS trial, is not um, looking at sort of the pharmacokinetic aspects of my trial. It's actually a different thing, which is looking at um, stopping um, a long-term antibiotic is a thromycin in patients that are and COPD. And, and, and can we stop it safely? Um, what's a seasonal approach? Um, and uh, we're looking at patient reported outcomes. And a big aspect, certainly, so my trial is, is real world patients and the sort of the lack of evidence at the moment is we, we, we start patients on this medicine, azithromycin, but we don't actually know can we safely stop it? And what patients actually gain the most benefit from azithromycin, because the, the original trials were done in a different trial group to our real world population. Um, and certainly multimorbidity, um, you know, COPD based patients have a very high multimorbidity. And it's actually um, a sub study um, in my study I'm, I'm looking at is frailty in the context of multimorbidity um, in COPD patients. Um, because there's actually Apart from the trial intervention I'm looking at, which is, is to continue azithro to stop it or seasonal, um, I'm going to be looking at sort of the observational long term follow up of patients on azithromycin, uh, looking at their frailty trajectory um, and looking at their multimorbidity at baseline and over time. So I, I think certainly, although it's, it's a clinical trial, it's very much a real world patient group. And I hope that certainly this information in terms of the primary condition of COPD and their multi-morbidity that I can certainly um, provide some information on that. And particularly with azithromycin, for example, we have um, always concern about um, cardiac arrhythmia or um, cardiac side effects. And obviously COPD patients have um, a higher risk of cardiovascular disease and, and these potential concerns. And certainly in this trial, I hope I'll be able to provide some data uh, in, in particular on that safety um, aspect, uh, which is important um, in terms of our patients, because the original trials certainly excluded any patients with concern of about long, you know, azithromycin and, um, uh, and cardiovascular risk in terms of uh, prolonged QT. So, but yes, that's um, sort of practically how, how I hope to do it in, in the OPAS trial. It is a really challenging one, isn't it? When you're when you you want to do a clinical trial, and normally you're doing a clinical trial because you have a, a medication that you know is going to help, but you also know that those groups are quite vulnerable, and you <laughs> so it's that balance, that balance of risk. Maria, I don't know if you wanted to add anything before we move on to our next question. No, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm here uh, coming back to my to the times that I I taught, you know, very very uh, superficially uh clinical pharmacology so I, i'm really enjoying enjoying the discussions but i i think that's something that is um really really crucial is who are who are we uh who who we think the trial is for and who are we trying to treat and to understand how these different groups they you know i think that the comorbidity side of things from what i'm learning with you today very particularly and obviously with uh, catriona in the pregnancy and breastfeeding side of things i think that there, there are important gaps there and particularly with copt we know everything that is associated the, the lifestyle uh, and all that i think that the people that need the most um are naturally excluded from 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 this approach and yeah it's it's something that needs to be tackled but i also understand that it's not something that is it, as you said uh marie it's uh it's from the primary care all the way to the clinical trials there is a, a whole a, a pipeline where and you know a leaking pipeline where we end up losing people and losing allies in the process so it's it's challenging but we need to start somewhere 
and it's good to see you know that it, it is right and that leads nicely on to the next question again from an anonymous attendee and it says how can clinical trials be appropriately promoted to underserved communities to increase engagement, which is something we're talking about. So I don't know who wants to start by elaborating a bit more. What can we do to get these underserved communities to, to actually? Um... I'm going to start from, not from the clinical trial perspective, but in general, I think that we, we tend to use this deficit model for everything when it comes to, any protected characteristic or you know including socioeconomic status and that we, we are not you know we need to do something because people don't understand us i think that they do understand this but what we are saying does not matter to to them and i think it's a, a matter of 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 creating not only the bond but this you know this the we need to show it's relevant to to that context and i think that's something that is missing and it, the, it it's almost like you know i i I'm, I'm a portuguese native portuguese speaker but the only language i speak other than portuguese is english so it doesn't matter if i get in iceland and speaks to a native that does not speak english very slowly in english or in portuguese it's not going to make it easier for them i think that there is uh, a code switch and a, a humility in the relationship that we, we need to establish to make it relevant to the people we are here to serve ultimately. May I try speaking? Yes, yes, yes. It, You're clear. Working? You're clear. Perfect. Oh, good. Um, uh, we've, I've done some things that to me have been interesting and new in the last couple of years in that I've employed a peer mother on my research team. So she's a young woman living with HIV that has four children and she serves as a kind of intermediary between study participants and even between the Ugandan nurses and people. So potential participants and patients tell her stuff because she's one of them. And I've also, courtesy of Welcome, who have funded me nicely, um, been able to employ a public engagement officer. And he comes from a, a journalism and a very different background to many of the team. And what I find really helps there is he'll tell me, you're talking too much jargon. We've done some work with film producers as well. Um, the film producer we work with, he, he grew up in a slum area of Kampala. And often he would stop me and say, look, I know you think you're being clear here, but you're talking to, you need to put it a different way. And I find that humility was a word you used, Maria Augusta. And I think it's that, it's remaining vulnerable and not feeling that because we're the professors, we're meant to know. Actually, how can we know? being willing to be taught, being willing to be told, actually, you being in this room right now is actually not helpful. Um, there are some situations we have to accept that. So I think it's increasing the diversity of the research team and employing people that look like the people that we want to enroll and getting them to go out with the messages. I find that quite helpful. It is a really difficult difficult challenging thing to do because even sometimes um uh, you, when you do have someone from that community they're seen as um if you like um someone who's if you like not on their side and and and, and some so you, you also have that challenge um maria i don't know if you had anything to contribute to this particular question before i move on to the next one no but i would just echo that um what Maria Augusta said, I think uh, you, you said it so eloquently in terms of certainly it's 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 our side and it's that needs to change. And I think a humility in terms of considering what we need to do to be able to um, uh, uh, um, it, it, it ensure that underserved groups uh, rather than underrepresented groups, the underserved groups, I would say, um, participate in, in, in research first name um, question i'm i'm going to you just use a part of it because um um for time reasons for amongst other things and it's really the idea that 
um, are we drawing unrealistic conclusions from clinical trials? How can we avoid that? And um, um, yeah, so is that really a challenge? Is, is, is something that I'm input to you? Do you think we get a realistic view of how a drug is going to um, work in a general population from the current populations that we, we have? Or do you think um, we're, we're not getting realistic um, um, data? So it's a good question. I, I, I don't know, Katina might be able to answer, but from a, a, a clinical trial, say in, in an academic paper perspective, I think you and it's, if it's a positive trial, I think you're get, definitely getting the best <laughs> result of that with your very strict inclusion exclusion criteria of patients. Um, and it's for drug companies to certainly show the most efficacious data in, in the cleanest data set to show that. However, when you go out into the real world population, um, I do think that that um, benefit uh, may be certainly muted um, and uh, in the context of everything else that's going on. And also the side effect profile may certainly be increased for, for different reasons as well. So I do think that the real world, certainly population who will be given the drug um, at the end of it all is, 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 the, is the population that we should be looking at in terms of clinical trials and not just in an observational post um, yeah. post uh, license analysis it needs to be I think at the, at the um, within the clinical trials um, actually um, uh, concept of, of where we get that data. Interestingly that was some of the I suppose both some of the advantages and disadvantages of the, the COVID um, clinical trials in that we had such large numbers, which are unusual. So you, in theory, at least you, you got good data, but then we still found that <laughs> when you went into the real world, those clinical trials didn't always 100% match what um, the, the companies were saying. So yeah, I, mean, I don't know if anyone else wanted to join in with that. I think sometimes it's the adherence as well to the treatment. Like in our pregnancy and breastfeeding trials, we have like zero loss to follow up. And in real life, pregnant and breastfeeding women, their life is kind of chaotic um, for obvious reasons, but they don't always take every single medication at the right time. But when someone's in a trial and they're getting reminders and they're engaging with the study team, they often have much, much better, like perfect adherence then when you roll the drug into the real world, we don't have that. Also side effects, which could be rare or longer term or something we're not going to see that in a short trial of a couple of hundred people. So that's also a risk. So, yeah, I think the clinical trial, it presents a very unusually perfect example. And then we need to go into, I think we need both. I think you do need those trials though, but then you need, to back it up with the real world data and the real world surveillance that Marie has been mentioning. And I think the databases, having everybody's medical information on a national database and being able to sort of draw virtual trials out of, out of the national records is also a very powerful thing that can be done. Uh, one of the things I spent my time doing around the COVID vaccines was explaining to people the difference between like, um, an adverse effect and a, and, and a side effect and, and, and how one was, you know, what, what you, you expect one and the other one is quite a rare thing to happen. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And uh, this one's, oh, it's, it's, I think it's moved. Okay, this one's from Maria. Um, and it says, what, what shifts in the gatekeeper and enablers would it would be required to make the research environment more for us? And I presume she's talking about um, certain minority groups. There is a lot of waste of talent from those uh, hoping to be researchers and them leaving because of the current rules for excellent excludes or penalizes them. So what he's saying is, how can we change the activity of the gatekeepers so that you can get more people who look like you, Marie, for, Maria, sorry, um, into research? Do you, what specifically do you think could be done? I I think it's a it's a cultural shift, and I think that the only the only um, institution or institutions that can do that are the funders. I think the funders, they've got a very important role to play. Um, the cultural shift comes from the fact that what we are assessing is not 
is not um, potential, it's outcome. So I, I, I made the case of using my daughter as a, an example of outcome. Okay. She, does, she didn't have, no, I, I'm not wealthy, but I worked in academia all my life. You know, for her, a professor, oh yeah, okay. You know, is someone that she, she, she went with me to the pub and, and that, that's her reality. That's, you know, she, she sees it, yeah, nice. Um, that's not the reality, the reality of most young people, particularly people from underserved groups. So I think that what we see is outcome, what the way we evaluate, the way that we select the students to do up the PhD with us, you know, the, the early career researchers, it, what we see is outcome. They went to Cambridge, they went to Oxford, they, they did a postdoctoral, um, they got a postdoctoral um, fellowship in San Diego. You, 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 and we've got all these codes, you know, that I, I call the secret handshakes that take people. And actually, I, I, I don't think that we are keeping the most talented people. Mind you, that's what keep us, that's what make, we learn the, the handshakes, people like uh, Winston and myself, and actually women um, from my generation. I think that the, the, the importance is to understand the, the yeah, this uh, Catriona put here the survivorship bias. Um, we are harder uh, at ourselves. We are harder at people as well. So I think that it's really important to to have this acknowledgement that we we are losing talent. If we change the, I don't believe that systems change because you know we want a world that's fairer to everyone. Maybe I'm too cynical, but that that's my. Sorry, I went into a rant, Winston. Sorry. Because okay, I've, got, I've got three women with me on, on this panel and we were talking about what the funders can do. And, um, and so sort of two things. Um, I know um, some funders, um, they will only fund institutions that have a certain level of Athena Swan, for example. Now, how important do you think that was in terms of getting more women into into science or into because now Athena Swan is about academia rather than just science but how important something like that is where there's an initiative that says if this university doesn't have a scene Athena Swan whatever the level is we're not going to give you or you're not you're not eligible to apply do you think there should be more of that kind of thing so there's something called a race equality charter mark for example and could that be used in the same way who wants to answer that I don't know that's a good one, isn't it? I, I think that, you know, um, Kimberly Crenshaw is the American person, uh, um, lawyer, academic, that coined the term intersectionality. And she says that what we live today is basically dealing with the intersectional failures of the past. And I think that's the, the issue with the charters because they, they are seen as standalone pieces and just seeing, you know, people, you know, we've got women, we've got people of color and without really understanding the, the, the intersections of all these things and with disability, with neurodivergence, with socioeconomic status. So uh, I, I, I think that, um, I, I, I can see, I think that Athena Swan was great to increase representation of women in, in science. I think that, you know, it's, it's a fact, um, but we still don't see as many women getting, going to leadership roles. We, do, we, we, we still see that you know, there is the glass ceiling, there is the lead ceiling, you know, because it's, it's much worse than, than glass sometimes. So I, I think that, um, and, and things that are done with, you know, just like team science is something I'm very committed to. I'm, I'm, I'm the leadership and group of, of a, a DTP, a doctoral training partnership in drug discovery and team science. 
but you know even team science can be used in a way of appeasing people and people making people less um unsettled when they observe things that they don't like very much no everybody's part of the team it doesn't matter if you're not the first author when actually you know that you need to be the first author to to be promoted so how can we change things in a way that we we, we talk the talk and walk the, the walk i think is is the important thing and i think what what i'm hearing when you're speaking is that if these initiatives are just rhetoric if they're just there so that universities can tick boxes and feel satisfied with themselves, they're, they're not very good. But if they provide a forum where there is more discussion of these matters and through Athena Swan, for me, it was very helpful because when I first got involved, I think I just had my third or my fourth child. I don't know. Um, ended up having five. I, I didn't. <laughs> see many people like myself and in fact I was told many times that it would be impossible to have a good academic career and a vibrant family life and that I certainly would not be promoted right up to professor whilst being less than full time and actually I don't think I would have dared try if I hadn't had the encouragement of role models through things like Athena Swan and I suppose it's people like us even maybe the conversation we're having now, who knows who's listening, that seeing that things that we've been told are impossible and maybe in our heart we feel are impossible, we can be our own barriers too. Um, so I feel these race equality charters, if it's just words, I'm not so happy. Some of the funders are also great. Welcome, always been really supportive for diversity. In fact, they've even got stronger on that lately, if you've read anything um, other initiatives, yeah. Yes, yes, they're definitely, they're definitely supporting, which is really good. So we're getting really close to the final sort of minutes. So uh, again, I say, if there are any things that you're dying to say, please sort of like go ahead and say it now over the next two minutes, because apparently in two or three minutes I have to do is just closing, and I'll, I won't be saying much. I never do. Um, so go ahead, uh, uh, Marie or Maria, uh, if you have anything finally that you want to say that you, you feel you didn't quite say. So Katrina, she mentioned welcome. And I think that, you know, welcome a few weeks ago said, we are an institutionally racist place. And I think that's the kind of statement that I would like other universities and funding bodies to do and have actions following these up. I think that this, this recognition is really important. You know, it does, we are misogynist, we are racist, and we are going to do something about this. I think that's the what I would like to see because uh, Athena's one, I think it's amazing, but, and there's no but, it is amazing, period. However, I would like to see, um, I, I, I would like to see something a bit more, um, radical happening in this space but that's what i want is not what's going to happen but you know we are acknowledging we all we are you know we we are, we crack the code even if you don't have the characteristics um we crack the code to occupy these spaces therefore what i don't want is other people to go through the same to the same hurdles i don't want them to crack the code i don't want them to see to be less than themselves to thrive and help this, um, you know, this fantastic enterprise, in this case, the clinical research and, and make it more equitable. Okay, right, so it's, uh, it's now um, 7.55 and it's sort of time for me to say my closing remarks. First of all, I really wanna thank the attendees who stuck with us, it's nearly eight o'clock and we've still got 37 people. So we've lost about five, that's not bad. Remember, this is gonna be on YouTube. Someone asked about um, sharing email and LinkedIn pages. I suppose if um, that should be available through the Royal Society in terms of the, the publicity information, or if you, I presume, just by looking at our names, you, you go on LinkedIn, you'll find us in some way, or, uh, or if you email our institutions, that you, you, you look up our institutions, you'll find us there. Now, when I was asked to do this, to chair this, and I was given a long list of um, 
um, potential presenters, I you know I, I sort of look through who would be interesting, and 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 I, I um, and and I thought you would you would all would make just by reading because I didn't really know any of you, so I, I just sort of read what you'd done and your names, and I and I thought yeah this would make a really interesting talk because it's really important when you talk about things like inequality that you talk to people who perhaps may have experienced some of it um first hand or observed it in in, in some way so um, i'm really pleased with what we've produced i'm really apologies again for the <laughs> the, the sort of um jerky start but i think we, we we covered some topics and hopefully this is just i always say again when i do a lot of my presentations this is the start of the journey on the conversation so happy to continue this and again uh, thank you to the royal society of biology for um, um allowing us to do this so thank you very much Thank you all very much. I learned so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. great. <laughs> Likewise, thank you. Thank you. That was great.